With the introduction of the new diesel trains, certain modified rules and regulations have had to be introduced. Some of these rules, together with the procedure for coupling and uncoupling these trains, will be illustrated in this film. If either of two diesel trains to be coupled is carrying passengers, the moving train must be driven and not propelled onto the stationary one. A member of the station staff, or the guard, must always stand as marker, not less than six feet behind the stationary train. As the train approaches, it must stop level with him, and then proceed only after he has given permission, which must not be given if passengers are about to enter or leave either train. The driver of the second train must immediately stop the engines, completely destroy the vacuum in reservoir and train pipe, and turn off the control circuit switch. In the cab of the first train, the Met Camel, this has already been done and the handbrake has been applied. Not more than one tail lamp may be carried on the train, so this one must be removed and put in the brake compartment before the guard goes off duty. The driver, who will take the train on, should satisfy himself that the coupling up is carried out satisfactorily. The shunter, working systematically, disconnects the air pipe screw coupling and vacuum pipes along the end of one train, and then does the same on the other train. Now the screw coupling must be connected and then correctly tightened. Next, the air pipes are connected. and the cocks for the compressed air system on each train turned on. The vacuum brakes are connected next. The mountings and ends of the pipes are painted to avoid confusion when coupling. Black denotes train pipe and blue the high vacuum side. Small locking pins are provided to ensure safe connections. The pipes are connected, crossed like this under the screw coupling. The shunter is now ready for the jumper cables. Two of these are kept in each cab, in a cupboard by the door in the Derby lightweight, and in a small cupboard behind the driving seat in the Met Camel train. Permanently mounted jumper cables with dummy couplings is a modification gradually being introduced. These jumper cables carry the electrical control circuits between the two trains. On each side of each train, there are two connector boxes mounted side by side to receive the sockets on the ends of the jumper cables. Care must be taken to keep the contacts dry and free from dirt and damage. The cables are fitted parallel to each other but it is difficult to connect them wrongly because the casing of the sockets and plugs are moulded differently. There is a male and female moulding provided, as you can see here. It is essential that the cables are pushed home properly and that all eight safety clips are firmly secured. Up to four two-car sets with a maximum of eight engines may be coupled together and the procedure in each case is the same as you have just seen. In the cab of the second train, the brake handle, 
Reversing lever. And control circuit key are put into the satchel. And both cab doors locked by the driver going off. He should take his satchel with him. The driver and guard of the complete train must now walk to the rear. The guard to check on his tail lamp. And the driver to reset the destination indicator. He must ensure both these cab doors are locked when he leaves. Returning to the leading cab, He switches on the control circuit key, starts all four engines, and recreates the vacuum. It is now necessary for the guard and driver to test the vacuum brake. The guard must check that a reading of 21 inches is registered on the gauge in his compartment. This will show that the vacuum pipes have been properly connected and that there is no blockage or fault in the coupling. On receiving seven buzzes, the driver applies the vacuum brake again and releases the handbrake. The train is now ready to move. The guard gives the driver two buzzes and the train leaves. We catch up the train again at the point where the two parts will be uncoupled. The uncoupling procedure is very much the same except that everything is carried out in the opposite order. In the leading cab, the engines are stopped, vacuum destroyed, and the control circuit switched off. The shunter begins to disconnect the jumper cables and the driver has to apply the handbrake in the leading cab of the second train. The first two cables will be put into this cab. While the uncoupling continues, another driver comes on duty to take charge of the second train. He will put this pair of cables into the other cab. Both vacuum pipes are uncoupled. The compressed air system cocks turned off and the air pipes disconnected. Lastly, the screw coupling is unhooked and fixed on its anchorage. On the rear of the first train, the air pipe is secured and then the two vacuum pipes fixed firmly on their dummy couplings. The same procedure is followed on the front of the second train. A tail lamp must be placed on the rear of the first train and after the engines have been started and the vacuum recreated, it is ready to continue on its journey.
The second train has now to be shunted into a siding where it will remain for a short time. Since in this case it must move backwards a short distance and forwards for a longer one, the shunter will ride in the cab which will now lead and the driver will propel the train for the first part of the movement. The vacuum brake has been tested and the handbrake released. The shunter must watch all signals, use the horn when necessary, and be ready to apply the guard's vacuum brake in an emergency. As the train clears the points, the driver stops the train, throttles right back, reverses the drives, and as the points change, is ready to drive forward into the siding. Meanwhile, our other train has entered a section where the signals are not track-circuited and is checked by a signal which has neither a telephone nor a fireman's call plunger. After waiting two minutes, the guard buzzes five times to the driver in accordance with the code to inform him that he is leaving the train to carry out Rule 55. But if the signal has a telephone, it is now the driver's duty to carry out Rule 55. In this case, he is not leaving charge of the train, and he need only destroy the vacuum and ensure that the compartment door is locked he should leave the control switch on and the engines running. After contacting the signal box, he returns to the train. The working of diesel trains over single lines has called for an alteration to the token exchange arrangements. And for these trains, the exchange of staff or token must take place only when they are stationary. Remember when accepting the staff to check that it is the correct one for the section. After the staff has been handed over, the train must not proceed until it is signalled onto the single line. At the other end of the section, the train must be stopped and the staff handed over to the signalman. Here is one of the uses of the dead man's button on the other side of the cab. Providing it is depressed within five seconds of releasing the throttle, it delays air entering the timing chamber.
train can now continue on its journey. It is important to remember that diesel trains run very quietly. A two-tone horn is fitted, both tones of which should be used for a warning, one after the other, to avoid the sound of being confused with the horn of a car. A single note must be used for routing or other codes. It is essential to give adequate warning to gangers and anyone else working on or near the running lines. They are instructed to acknowledge your horn with a wave of the arm so that you know that it has been heard. On lines where these trains do not normally run, it is also necessary to use the horn when approaching gangers' huts, all types of crossings, curves, at buildings near the track and at all bridges and viaducts. 